Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare Rama Hare
such kind of a program. So I just want to give a brief introduction about what kind of program we are going to have today. And also we will briefly speak about the small introduction of our, our today's speaker. So today we are going to have a program on uh, the yoga of devotion, which is Bhakti Yoga. And also the importance of chanting this Kirtan, what we were doing, Hare Krishna Kirtan. So, Many of us know yoga means, you know, mostly it's related to body physics, how to keep body healthy. But yoga is much more beyond that. The yoga, real yoga is about the yoga of the spirit. So we are going to a little bit discuss today about the yoga of devotion, that is Bhakti Yoga. And we are very fortunate to have His Grace Devakinandan Prabhu with us this evening. He is a Bhakti Yoga practitioner from last 24 years. Uh, he started his practice at a very early age, at the age of around 13 or maybe I think much before that. And uh, he is traveling all over the world. He is preaching the message of his Bhakti Yoga, message of Bhagavad Gita, and how to practice uh, the pure devotion with the God in our life. And he has developed a congregation in Singapore. He is basically stationed in Singapore for many years. And by profession, he is into legal advisory profession. He is heading a project uh, of a SCON temple and a school in uh, Dwarka. And he keeps traveling, you know, all over the world. And so in Singapore, he gives classes and also guides and mentors people in how to practically uh, apply emotional principles in our own life. And that has benefited many, many people all over the world. People are inspired by his speeches. He is very popular and famous about his speeches and his expertise and knowledge about Bhagavad Gita. So we are very fortunate to have him here. Uh, so we'd like to welcome him in our traditional way, you know, by loudly three times chanting Hari Bol. Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol. Thank you, Harish. Thank you, Seva Prabhu. 
for having given us this opportunity to come together. How many of you have come here for the first time? Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Um, there is a nice verse from the Gita, which um, which actually makes a lot of sense when we read it. So maybe the best thing to do is to start by chanting the verse and uh, read what Krishna, who is the speaker of the Gita, has to say. And then we can read the purport or the commentary to that verse. And then we'll try and say something on that verse. And then we can end the program with questions or some realizations. Um, and then we can chant the holy names like we did just now. Let's let's go on with this. Chapter two, text sixty-six. Nastir buddhira yuktasya. Nastir buddhira yuktasya. Na cha yuktasya bhavana. Na cha yuktasya bhavana. Na cha bhavayata shanti. Na cha bhavayata shanti. Ashantasya kutasukam. Ashantasya kutasukam. Nasti buddhira yuktasya. Nasti buddhira yuktasya. Acha yuktasya bhavana. Acha yuktasya bhavana. Acha bhavayata shanti. Acha bhavayata shanti. Ashantasya kutasukam. Ashantasya kutasukam. Nasti buddhira yuktasya. Nasti buddhira yuktasya. Nacha yuktasya bhavana. Nacha yuktasya bhavana. Nacha bhavayata shanti. Nacha bhavayata shanti. Ashantasya kutasukam. Ashantasya kutasukam. Does anyone like to chant? Nasti buddhira yuktasya Nasti buddhira yuktasya Nacha yuktasya bhavana Nacha yuktasya bhavana Nacha bhavayata shanti Nacha bhavayata shanti Ashantasya kutasukam Ashantasya kutasukam Maybe one of the ladies? Nasti buddhira yuktasya Nasti buddhira yuktasya Nacha yuktasya bhavana Nacha yuktasya bhavana Nacha bhavayata shanti Nacha bhavayata shanti Ashantasya kutasukam Ashantasya kutasukam Let's read the synonyms. Na asti. Na asti. They cannot be. They cannot be. Buddhihi. Buddhihi. Transcendental intelligence. Transcendental intelligence. Ayuktasya. Ayuktasya. Of one who is not connected. Of one who is not connected. With Krishna consciousness. With Krishna consciousness. Na. Na. Not. Na. Cha. Cha. And. And. Ayuktasya. Ayuktasya. Of one devoid of Krishna consciousness. Of one devoid of Krishna consciousness. Bhavana. Bhavana. Fixed mind. Fixed mind. In happiness. In happiness. Na. Na. Not. Not. Cha. Cha. And. And. Abhavayata. Abhavayata. Of one who is not fixed. Of one who is not fixed. Shantihi. Shantihi. Peace. Peace. Ashantasya. Of the unpeaceful. Of the unpeaceful. Kutaha. Kutaha. Where is? Where is? Sukham. Sukham. Happiness. Happiness. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A. C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki. Please repeat the translation. One who is not connected. One who is not connected with the Supreme. With the Supreme. In Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness. Can have. Can have. Neither transcendental intelligence. Neither transcendental intelligence. Nor a steady mind. Nor a steady mind. Without which, without which, there is no possibility of peace. There is no possibility of peace. And how can there be, and how can there be any, happiness any happiness without peace? Without peace. Please hear the purport. Unless one is in Krishna consciousness, there is no possibility of peace. So it is confirmed in the fifth chapter that when one understands that Krishna is the only enjoyer of all the good results of sacrifice and penance, that he is the proprietor of all universal manifestations, and that he is the real friend of all living entities, then only can one have real peace. Therefore, if one is not in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be a final goal for the mind. Disturbance is due to want 
of an ultimate goal. And when one is certain that Krishna is the enjoyer, proprietor, and friend of everyone and everything, then one can, with a steady mind, bring about peace. Therefore, one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace, however much he may make a show of peace and spiritual advancement in life. Therefore, one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace, however much he may make a show of peace and spiritual advancement in life. Krishna consciousness is a self-manifested, peaceful condition which can be achieved only in relationship with Krishna. Krishna consciousness is a self-manifested, peaceful condition which can be achieved only in relationship with Krishna. Just such a beautiful verse. Om Agnana Timirandasya Nyanam Chamashalakaya Chakshurum Vilikam Yena Tasmaya Shri Vrayama Sri Chaitanya Avishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutare Swayam Rupa Adamayam Radhi Swapadam Dikam Mandeham Shri Guru Shri Rupakam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sarayagunatam Vitantam Sajeevam Sarvaitam Sarvaitam Arijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sarana Adhita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha Te Krishna Karuna Sindho Lina Vado Vajarapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Mahostate Atatanjana Gorande Radhe Vrinda Hamshita Vrishadhanu Sute Devi Pranamani Haritri Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namni Gavritu Shenama Vancha Kalpatru Yascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayacha Patitana Pavani Yo Vaishnavi Vyodamona Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Sri Vasa Gura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this verse is considered to be one of the most important verses in the Gita because it touches on the most practical point that every one of us is looking for. Two words in this verse is very important. One is happiness and the other is peace. And the connection between both of them are very nicely given here. It is stated by Krishna that without peace we cannot have happiness. And it's an interesting thing to think about. Sometimes we think that happiness is one thing, peace is the other. But in the Gita it's very clearly said that until we obtain some level of peace, it is very hard to be happy. Meaning to say that happiness in this world without connection to our Supreme Creator is happiness that cannot last. Because if you notice something around you, the nature of this world is that everything changes. And change is so fast that before we know it, you know, things that we thought were stable, they always become unstable. Very often, all the things that were stable when we were young, they have left us. The people whom we have depended on, sometimes they are dependable, sometimes they are not. Through no fault of their own sometimes. Very often in our life, we try to get happiness by investing some feeling, some feeling of dependence on someone else or some situation to happen. We always think that when this happens, I will become happy. Or if this doesn't happen, then I will stay happy. But I think it is our experience in everyday life that the moment we have an expectation, the nature of the expectation is, even if you try to obtain that expectation, it is very difficult to maintain it. 
And because of expectations, many of our relationships fail. Because very often we tend to overexpect and we tend to underachieve. And very often when we expect so many things from others, we forget that others are also expecting many things from us. And it becomes a very difficult situation because our happiness becomes so dependent on something which is external. That is why the definition of God consciousness or Krishna consciousness is given very nicely here. Krishna consciousness is self-manifested. In other words, genuine peace comes from within. Until and unless we are peaceful from within, it is very difficult to be peaceful outside. Sometimes it's easy for us to make a show that we may be very spiritual. But the real test of one who is spiritual is whether he or she is inherently peaceful and whether that peace can be transmitted from one person to the other. And that is a very difficult thing. That is why the word yoga has a very deep meaning in the Gita. The word yoga comes from the word to yoke, Y-O-K-E. And if, if you look at history, you find that people would till their lands and fertilize their lands by yoking it. And the idea of yoke comes from the Sanskrit word yoga. Yoga also means to connect. And that is why this verse 266 is very important. Because here, Krishna, the speaker of the Gita, who is non-different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he makes a very important statement. He says that until and unless we are connected somehow or another to our Supreme Creator, then two things will elude us. One, we will not have transcendental intelligence. Meaning to say, we may have material intelligence. Many of us have our degrees, and we do well materially. But when it comes to our emotions and challenges of life, we find that all the amount of money and everything that we have achieved in the material world doesn't necessarily translate into everlasting peace and happiness. In fact, very often, if you speak to people who have much more than you and I may have, you, you find that they also tell you that well, we also have great sets of problems. In fact, the nature of the world is Everyone thinks that he is only suffering. And sometimes when we meet each other, the irony of life is that we start comparing notes on how much I have suffered compared to you. And very often, you know, we find, we take a strange pleasure in telling someone, Prabhu, you think you have suffered? Oh, wait till you hear about my life. And it's ironic because the whole point of our existence is to achieve happiness. But here we are trying to compete to find out who has suffered more. And the problem with material happiness in this world, the Gita and all scriptures tell us, is that it doesn't last. So that which is temporary always brings disturbance. If you notice, that which doesn't last always drags us. And the beauty of this material world is that even for a fraction of a moment of happiness, we are prepared to endure great moments of difficulties and sadness. And we don't realize that these two are so disproportionate after a while, it just doesn't make sense. There's a nice story in our scriptures of a man who wanted to get honey from under a great oak tree. The honey was in, the, uh, was in a beehive. And of course, to get it, he had to cross over a, a fair amount of terrain, dangerous forest. And he was, actually told, uh, by, he was actually told by many of the villagers who were living with him, don't go there, it's very dangerous. So the man decides, no, I want to get that honey. So he crosses the wall and he enters into this deep dark forest. And when he enters into it, immediately, you know, he's chased by wild animals. So he runs away from them deeper into the forest. Then there are some ghosts and spirits which inhabit the forest. And they also chase him from one end. So he's being chased this side by wild animals and that side by spirits and goblins and ghosts. And he keeps running away from them. And just as he comes, he sees in the center of the forest is that great oak tree that he's looking for. And as he reaches that tree, he spies the hive and he sees the bees. But he also knows that he's being chased. So he has to solve that problem first. As he runs as fast as he can, he doesn't see a pit, which is just beneath the tree. And he falls into the pit. And he thinks that he's going to break his head or his leg. But just before he hits the ground in the depth of the pit, his feet get stuck on the branches of the tree, the roots of the tree, which have you know, actually come out onto the ground. It's a big old tree. So his feet are actually stuck and he's dangling upside down. Now when he looks deeper into the hole, 
he realizes that he's not alone. He sees two a pair of eyes, you know, which look very fierce. And he realizes there's a huge cobra at the bottom of the pit. And it is just waiting for him to drop. So then he realizes when he looks up that on this side of the pit, the wild animals have stopped and they are waiting. And on this side, all those ghostly entities, they are also waiting. He's in a precarious situation. And because he has actually hit the roots of the tree, he has disturbed the beehive. Anyone been stung by bees before? <laughs> Except for me, okay, fine. Mother, you're here. Good. You'll understand it's not a very pleasant experience. Huh? Yeah. Depending on where they sting you, it gets really bad. So anyway, he was being stung on his face by the bees also because the bees came down and they were disturbed. Despite the difficulty of the pain of the stings, despite the precarious condition of all these living entities waiting to catch him and the cobra at the bottom of the pit, and the fact that after a while he realized that even his feet were becoming dislodged from the roots because rats had come and started gnawing the roots. It was only a matter of time. If he drops into the pit, he'll be bitten by the cobra. If somehow he gets out of the pit, either side will get him. And if not, he'll be stung to death by the bees. But despite all that, the story goes that the man was still smiling. And we wonder why he's smiling. Because he realized while hanging upside down and having disturbed the hive, he found that if he stuck his tongue out perpendicular, he would actually be able to lick or at least taste a drop of honey that was just dropping from the hive at the top. And it was so wonderfully positioned that if he just stuck his tongue out, he could taste that honey. And every time he tasted that one drop of honey, the man thought, this is all right. It's not so bad, you know. I think I can go on for a little while longer. It's okay, it's okay. And Sastras, the scriptures, they tell us, this is our condition. This is the way we live in this world. Yam yam artam upadate, shukkena dukkena hetavi, tam tam dhunoti bhagavan, puman sochati antakrit. In the third canto, 31st chapter, second verse, this verse in Bhagavatam is very instructive. And this verse is a warning to everyone that while we try to collect so many material acquisitions in this life, thinking that they will become sources of our happiness forever, we don't realize that we acquire so much sadness and anxiety and difficulty just for a fraction of happiness. We work 30 days a year, a month at least, and then after we get our paycheck. And when we get our paycheck after all the hard work, we feel very relieved. But you and I know the relief is very temporary. The moment the paycheck goes to the hands of our wives or vice versa, depending on who's working, you'll find within a few days, you know, all the bills have to be paid, everything has to go. Money has a way of just leaving us as soon as it comes. And the truth of the matter is, the moment when we think we have acquired everything is only very fractional. Compared to the moment when we have to work very hard to acquire that moment of fraction. So, Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, they tell us to think carefully about how we are living. They don't tell us to necessarily discard what we do, what we do, but we should give it thought. And when we are connected to this material world and we are connected to matter, because matter cannot last, our connection must fail. But when you're connected to a powerhouse of energy which is eternal, then what happens? Then that connection is eternal. It's very simple, it's just like the lights here. These lights look very beautiful, but they only have value if they are connected to the main electrical powerhouse somewhere. Then when you turn on the switch, the light actually lights up. But if you have a beautiful chandelier right here, and it looks very nice, but you try turning it on, but it's not connected to the mains, then what happens? No matter how beautiful it looks, no matter how decorative it, it serves a function, its main function is that it cannot light up. So it is of no value. In the second canto, ninth chapter, I think it's the 34th verse, one of the seed verses of Bhagavatam, Krishna tells Brahma, Rite ritam yat pratieta, na pratieta chatmani, vidvan atmano mayam yatha basho yatha tamaha. The translation is very important. He says, Brahma, know for sure that anything in this world that has great value, no matter how valuable it is and how wonderful it is, please know that if it is not connected to me, then somehow or another, no matter how valuable it is, it actually has no value. Instead of uplifting you to become genuinely peaceful and happy, it actually drags you 
to the lower modes and the darkest regions. And that is why the most important purpose of yoga is to connect you to spirit and not to matter. Even if we perform the best exercises for our bodies, eventually the lifespan and the expiry date of the body has to come. It's only a question of time. But if we find a connection with who we are, the spirit soul, inhabiting the body, then we understand that we are not connected to this body. Then we will understand that when the body leaves us, the soul continues its passage. That's why in our scriptures it is said that all of us actually have four wives. And ladies, you have four husbands. One time there was a king, you know, and he had four wives. His first wife was his chief wife. And he took good care of her, maintained her very well. And he was always very proud of her. The second wife was very beautiful. So whenever he went to the neighboring kingdoms just to show off, you know, he would make sure his most beautiful wife was with him. And all the kings would say, wow, what an amazing king, you know, he has such beauty with him. The third wife was the lady who actually was very, very much a confidant. Someone who would socialize, someone who would always be there for the king. And she was the one who took care of all the children, the relatives, the social events. The fourth wife was his true well-wisher always there for him. Whenever everything else failed, the king would always come to the first, to the last wife. But the last wife was the least attractive. So the king was not so much attracted to her. And very often he tended to neglect her. <coughs> the time came now for the king to die. And the scriptures tell us as he lay on his deathbed, he thought, at least if I have to go, I should not leave alone. You know? I have four wives. One advantage of that is that I can at least ask one of them to come with me. So he turns to his first wife and he says, My dear wife, you are my chief wife. I've taken so good care of you through my life. Now I'm going to leave this body. Will you come with me? And she says, No, as much as I want to, I can't. Because the moment you leave and you leave this world, I cannot leave with you. I will have to continue to be here only. I cannot follow you where you go. It's not possible. So he's very disappointed, you know. But he thought, Well, at least I have three wives left. So he turns to the second wife and he says, My dear wife, you are the one I showered everything on. You come with me. She said, I'm still youthful. I still have my beauty. You are going to die. After you die, I'll get married to someone else. And I'll just continue with my life. I mean, we have to be practical about these things, my dear Lord. So the king was highly disappointed. So he turns to his third wife. And he says, you at least, you always heard me. We've always been good friends. You come with me. She said, if I come with you, who will take care of everyone else who's alive? Someone has to be there for them. So is it not my duty also? So I have to continue. And then finally, before he could ask anything, his fourth wife turns to him and says, My dear Lord, I will go with you. Because my nature is, wherever you have gone, I have been your well-wisher, and I will follow you. And like that, our scriptures tell us, every one of us, we have four wives or four husbands. The first wife is our body. And during the time of our lives, we are so connected to this body, we don't realize the body will go. But even then, the body is very precious to us. We pamper it like anything, you know. We make sure we smell nice. We make sure that we dress nice. Everything is related to the body. And when we grow old and the teeth is falling and the hair is going, and we find that now we don't look so nice and all our achievements are going, then what happens very often is if we have children, we live through our children. They become extensions of who we are. Oh, I like to dress this way, now I can't. So let's dress my child up very nicely. And in that way, we extend ourselves to all the people whom we love. But the truth of the matter is, we are still attached to this body. It's proxy. You know? So what happens is, this first wife is always our body. But we don't realize that at the point of death, the body is either cremated or it is buried. And it doesn't go with the soul. The soul has to make that journey alone. The second wife is all the acquisitions we acquire in this material world when we are alive. And we work very hard to maintain it. And we, to give something out from that pocket of ours is very difficult. Extremely difficult. We think hundred times before we do it. And we think that all this money will come with us when we also leave the world. But you and I know that at the point when we leave this body, nothing comes with us. All the acquisitions don't come with us. We can't bury our car with us. We can't take our you know, wallet with us. All the money in the world will not stop death from coming. 
So the point is, the second wife is actually all our acquisitions. Wherever we go in our lifetime, we tend to show them off. We try to show it. something at least we have, we have to show. You know, It's either that you know I have this or I have that. Sometimes we are subtle about it, sometimes we are gross about it. But we like to show it. The third wife is actually all our friends, our families, our relatives. They are our well-wishers genuinely. And very often when we are alive, they are there for us. But at the point of our death, they, with all the best wishes in the world, they cannot come with us. In fact, whenever they surround us as we die, because they are anxious about we dying, when we see their anxiety on their faces, we become more anxious as we die. <laughs> Bhagavatam tells us, when the man is about to die, he looks to all his relatives and loved ones for peace. But when he sees their faces showing, oh, you're going to die, he just loses whatever will he has, and he thinks, I'm definitely going to die. So even the man who is going to, not going to die, he dies when he sees the anxiety of his relatives. And that is the fact of life. So even our relatives and friends and loved ones, they can't come with us. They can't. The only person who can come with us is Paramatma, the Super Soul. It is the Super Soul, Krishna, who comes in the form of the ever-well-wisher. And our scriptures tell us that he is the eternal witness in our heart. He is the person who always travels with us. And we have moved life after life through body after body. But Krishna has seen us through everything. And yet, he is the person we neglect most. And that is why yoga is so misunderstood. Yoga has nothing to do with matter. It actually has to do with reviving your relationship with who you are and where you have come from. And who you are is determined by where you have come from. That is very important. Everyone in this world is only searching for one thing. And the verse tells us what it is. It is happiness. If you ask anybody anywhere in the world, what is the aim of your life? At some point, no matter what he tells you, he, if he tells you, my aim of life is to become a lawyer, why do you want to become a lawyer? Because I want to earn well. Why do you want to earn well? So that I can have this car. Why do you want to have this car? So that I can drive around. Why do you want to drive around? At the end of the day, he will have to come to this one point. Because he makes me happy. That's it. So it doesn't matter what we want in this life. But ultimately, we always want it for our happiness. In fact, Sastras tell us there are only two kinds of people who do not want to be happy in this world. One is the madman. The madman, he doesn't want to be happy. The second is a dead man, because a dead body cannot be happy. Other than these two personalities, everyone else wants to be happy. But we do not realize that the only way to become happy is to devote our lives to understanding where we have come from and who we are. And this devotion is considered to be the highest form of connection. And that is why it is known as Bhakti. Bhakti Yoga is one of many yogas that we have heard. The Gita speaks about another yoga, the yoga of action. And that is known as Karma Yoga. Then the, yoga, the Gita also speaks of another yoga, the yoga of knowledge, that is known as Jnana Yoga. And then Krishna ends the entire Bhagavad Gita by conclusively stating that even if we want to take up the yoga where we have to act and we have to serve God by working for Him, or even if we want to amass knowledge and spiritual knowledge to understand who we are and where we come from, both of these connections to God, they have on as their common denominator only one element, and that is the element of bhakti, and that is devotion. Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita is not a saintly personality sitting in a cave and meditating. He was a warrior and his job description was you have to just go out there and fight the opposite camp. That's his job description. It's a simple job for him to do. On the eve of the battlefield, he calls Krishna the charioteer and who is non different from God. And he says, my dear Krishna, pull me up to the middle so that I can see the battlefield and see who I'm going to fight with. And the moment he sees how the battlefield on the other side happen to be people who are related to him, he starts thinking, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. These are people who are related to me. This cannot help anyone. Why should I fight? A feeling of weakness comes to him. And he thinks now, this is not my duty. I don't have to fight. He puts down his bow and his arrows and he tells Krishna, I do not want to fight. Now Krishna here does not tell him, very good. 
Now you retire into the cave and you become a big sadhu. No, Krishna tells him completely the opposite. Krishna tells him that whatever you are doing now is really miserly because you're being very selfish. You're not seeing the big picture. The big picture is it's not what you want to achieve that's important. It is whether what you want to achieve is in alignment with what the Supreme Personality of Godhead wishes for you. In other words, if we understand that we have to work, we have to be active, but our activity should be for the pleasure of Krishna and for the pleasure of his devotees, then our work is not the normal natural work that anyone else is working. Our attitude becomes automatically one of devotion. Therefore, our employer is no more someone who will also experience birth, death, old age and disease. Our employer becomes the spiritual employer of all employers, and that's Krishna. So Krishna told Arjuna, all you need to do now is have a change of consciousness. And the only best way to change your consciousness is be clear about who's your big boss. Be clear about who you are here to satisfy. You are not here to satisfy your mind. Neither are you here to satisfy your senses. Because your mind is temporary and your senses will die. But if you are here to satisfy me, meaning Krishna, and if you are here to listen to my instructions, then because I am eternal, my instructions are eternal, and if you connect to my instructions, the happiness that you get and the peace that follows from it will also be eternal. And if you think about it, that makes complete sense. Because why are we running for that, which will eventually run away from us? It doesn't make sense. So then in the 8th chapter, 7th verse, Krishna says something that is so wonderful. The 8th chapter, 7th verse actually puts all the different yogas of Bhagavad Gita into one verse. And he actually summarizes how we can work for Krishna, how we can gather knowledge for Krishna, and how we can then become connected to Krishna. He says, Tasma Sarveshu Kaleshu, Maam Anusmara Yudhyacha, Mai Arpitta Mano Buddhir, it's very nice, Mai Arpitta Mano Buddhir, Maam Ivaishasi Asam Sayaha, page 7. And the translation is beautiful. If we can just meditate on this verse, if we forget everything else that we have spoken today and just remember this verse, we will understand the true meaning of yoga. What does Krishna say? Krishna says, Arjuna, you should always think of me. That's the first thing he says. Think of me. We think of so many things. We think of anything and everything except Krishna. Very often when we say, please chant the names of the Lord, we say, fine, we'll do it. But what will happen is we plan our day in such a way that we do everything. And at the end of the day, if I have a little time for Krishna, then I'll give it to him. If you really value someone, do you put him last in the queue or you put him first in the queue? It's very simple. Of course, our mind is so smart, we say, that which is last is most precious. So Krishna, I'm saving my last end of the day for you. But you and I know, given the way we live here, by the time we come to the end of the day, we always tell Krishna, Krishna, I'm so tired, I have to sleep now. And I don't have time to think of you. That which you love always comes first. So Krishna says, since you're always thinking of everything, you please think of me. That's what we should do. And sometimes people ask, what is the best way? How should we think of Krishna? It's very simple. You can best think of Krishna if you hear about Krishna. Have you realized that whenever you hear about someone, it's easier to think about them? After you've had an overseas call with someone whom you love or someone you've spoken to, you find that it's easier to remember the person. In other words, when you chant Krishna's names, it is very easy for you to remember him. So the first principle of yoga is to actually chant the names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And that is how our thought becomes focused. You'll find that your mind has a habit of running everywhere except the place you want it to be. Isn't it true? That's how it is. Minds are just like children. Anything you tell children, they tend to do the opposite. And the mind is exactly that way also. Because the mind's nature is, you cannot give it a chance. You have to discipline it. But you can't discipline it with matter, because matter is material, and mind is also material. You can only discipline it by chanting the transcendental vibrations 
of a mantra. If I and you were to chant Coca-Cola, 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 just after this we can do it for five minutes, you throw me out and I'll never come back again. Because if you try chanting Coca-Cola for 15 minutes, two things will happen. One, your thirst will not be quenched because Coca-Cola doesn't appear when you chant its name. And the other is at the end of it, you don't want to see Coca-Cola ever again because you're tired of chanting it. And that is how it is with everything in the material world. It only has some value for a while. Then you feel, I need a change. Look at the number of mobile phones we have changed since the day we were born. I don't know about how it is in the US, but in Singapore, it's practically one in two months. That's how it is. Everybody loves changing their handphones. And the moment they have the brand new handphone that comes, it's so wonderful. But the moment they hear there's another one that comes, well, this one has lost its shine. Thankfully, we don't do that to our wives and husbands. <laughs> That'll be very dangerous. In America, no. in America, you kind of do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so that's a little bit like the iPhones in Singapore. <laughs> All right. So thinking is very important, and that's why Krishna says you first of all start thinking of him. But to think of him, you must hear about him. Then you can think of him. So that's the first point. We hear about Krishna, and we think of him. So Arjuna was told by Krishna, Krishna, no Arjuna, you think of me. And while you think of me, how should you think of me? That's very important. He says, you think of me in the form of Krishna. You see this beautiful picture that we have here of Krishna? It is not a very difficult photo to look at. Nothing unpleasant about seeing Krishna. In fact, Krishna, if you notice, is always smiling in every photo. Something that you and I can't do. We can only smile for a while in the photo. You take us off the photo, then our true nature comes. In fact, Krishna is so kind that no matter who comes before him in the temple, he's still smiling. Imagine if we took the position of Krishna for one day and we became deities. We can't last the whole day smiling. We can't. It's very difficult for us to smile the whole day. That's why Krishna is Krishna and we are who we are. Because our form is material, but his form is transcendent. Just by seeing the form of Krishna, it's so easy to think about him. So if you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare And you chant by seeing his form, oh, then it becomes very easy to think about him. You see, now we have a triangle. We see Krishna, we hear Krishna, and therefore we can think about Krishna. And that's what he's telling Arjuna in the middle of the battlefield, mind you. So now he says, Arjuna, Think of me always in the form of Krishna and at the same time, now this is the tricky part, at the same time, carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. And you keep wondering, how is it going to be? You're fighting, fighting, and you have to see Krishna, how are you going to fight? How are you going to think of Krishna when you're fighting? Never mind if we are not fighting every day, hopefully we are not, but if we are working, how are we going to work and think of Krishna? That's a difficult thing, isn't it? But the Sastras give us a very simple example. Supposing you love someone very much. I can give the example of when, you know, when we have children, for example. And the children, you know, they are so wonderful. Before you leave the house, you see them and you become very really enamored by them. And whole day when you go to, to your work, you keep thinking about them even while you work. When you get a bad assignment or a bad boss or a bad day, you tell yourself, you know, I'm actually doing this for my family. The love of my family keeps me going. We've all gone through that before. It happens. If you've just become newly married and you are still you know, fresh out of the mint and you love your wife very much and she loves you very much, the first day or one week after the honeymoon when you both are separated and you go to your respective workplaces, I guarantee you for the whole day, while you're doing your work very expertly, your mind is always on the loving dealings with your wife and husband. Don't ask the people who have been married for 10 years. They give you different ideas. <laughs> but you ask those who are in the honeymoon period, they'll tell you, oh, I can identify with this. <laughs> but my point is, when there is an object of love and you are connected to it, then even while you perform other activities, you know that the motive for performing them is ultimately so that you can actually benefit or serve whom, those whom you love. It gives meaning. All Krishna is saying is, Arjuna, you have to fight because I want you to fight. You need to do this for a higher cause. But you need to do this while remembering me. If you remember why you are doing this, that translates automatically into remembering the person for whom you are doing it. 
It does. Another very interesting example Sashtras gave is that of a wife who is very chaste at home with her husband, but who actually has an affair with her lover outside. So what must she do at home? She has to make sure that her husband doesn't suspect her affair. So if you are messy with your things and you are distracted and you are disheveled and you are looking very, very, you know, uh, like you are thinking of something else, then you become a source of suspicion. But if an expert wife does all her household duties very nicely, such that no one suspects, but all the time she is thinking of a paramour of her lover, then what happens is she is able to capture that thought in her heart, but she is able to do all her duties very nicely. So this is a glimpse of how devotees live in this world. We are not expected to be at the level of Arjuna where 24 hours we can remember Krishna. But what Krishna is looking for is our sincere attempt to remember him. In Bhagavatam, there is an amazing statement in the 8th canto. I think it's the 2nd or 1st chapter. And it's in the purport of the 14th or 15th verse. I'll find it later if you want. In the last line, Prabhupada writes an amazing statement. I never found it anywhere else in Bhagavatam. He gives us the clue to this verse. How to remember Krishna always. He says, if we begin our activities for his satisfaction, then gradually we will lose taste for material activities. It's an amazing statement. We are all chanting and we are all practicing devotional service. And very often we ask ourselves, when will the day come when I automatically and naturally have a higher taste? But he gives us the clue. All we have to do is to start every activity by being clear about who we are doing it for. Be clear about that. Have that clarity. If you begin your activity by remembering that you are doing this to glorify Krishna and not to glorify ourselves, then Krishna gives you the power of remembrance to remember him throughout that activity. One time Narada came to Krishna in Dwarka and he said, Krishna, who is your most favorite devotee, especially on earth? Krishna said, there's this farmer out there, you know, he takes care of the cows and the fields, he's my favorite. Nada said, why? Nada was expecting he would be the favorite. Very disappointed. So he said, why? What does he do? He said, he's always thinking of me. Nada said, Krishna, I'm always thinking of you. So where's the difference? And Krishna said, no, but you have no other engagements. You, you're full time. <laughs> so you're remembering me always. But he has to work. So Nada said, I'm curious. Let me find out how he's working and remembering you. So, Nada, so Krishna said, let's go to earth in disguise. And we'll visit the farmer. So they go and see the farmer. The farmer welcomes them in his house as guests and he stay, they stay there. And they realize one thing interesting about him. He's working very hard in the fields. But every moment he has away from his work, he's chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Rama. And every time he can, he's singing something about Krishna. Whenever he can squeeze the time from somewhere, he's trying to remember some shloka about Krishna. And he's very, very wonderfully, expertly managing all his state of affairs. So they stay two days and other things, okay, fine, nothing fancy. And at the end of it, when Krishna says, so now do you know how great he is? Nada says, no. Frankly speaking, he's just like any other devotee. Whenever he has time, he remembers you. Krishna says, all right, I'm going to draw a straight line down, maybe five meters. You take a pot of water, Nada, put it on your head, and I want you to balance that pot and walk on that straight line. Can you do that for me? Nada said, all right, unusual request, but he's the Lord, what can I do? So he puts it on his head and he starts walking on that line. He's very careful to make sure he does it. And at the end of it, he stops, he puts it down, he says, my Lord, I've done it. So Krishna asked him a very simple question. From the time you started your walk from this end of the line to the other end, how many times did you think of me? Nada said, Krishna, be practical. <laughs> you told me to walk the line. I had water on my head in a pot and I'm trying to balance it. Do you really think I can think of you at that point? <laughs> Krishna smiled and said, this man, you know, this devotee, whom you say is very ordinary, every day he's walking that pot and he's walking that line by doing all his duties. But did you see and did you hear how many times he could remember me? How many times? And you just took a five meter walk and you could not even remember me for that half a minute that you took to walk. 
It's an interesting point, and it tells us one thing, that remembrance of Krishna while we are performing duties becomes difficult when we think that the duty is not performed for his satisfaction. But when it is performed as an instruction and it is performed out of love because the Lord wants me to do it, then remembrance of him despite all the challenges of our work becomes very natural. In fact, it becomes without separate endeavor. That is why when we chant Krishna's names, Krishna gives us the benediction of remembering him. He allows us to remember. And that is why Krishna says, at the same time, carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. So children, many of you are in schools. Your prescribed duty, according to Gita, is to be the best student you can be. If you turn to your parents and say, I want to become sadhu now, because Krishna says you have to give up everything, then unfortunately we have not understood the Gita. If husbands and wives after the, this program say, I have to give up everything and connect to Krishna, then we have lost the point also. Stane Stitaha. That is the two words used by Brahmaji in the verse in Bhagavatam. Wherever you are, you become just situated in your position and from there you think of Krishna, think of him, think of his form, at the same time carry out your prescribed duty and while you're carrying out your prescribed duty, please with your activities dedicated to me and with your mind and your intelligence fixed on me. This is very important. My arpitta mano buddhi. Our mind and intelligence can only be controlled when they are fixed on Krishna. And the easiest way to fix our mind on Krishna is to chant Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama, 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 Rama Hare. And the conclusion to that verse is very simple. If you just follow the simple formula of living in this world, then you will attain me without doubt. Krishna makes it very clear. And in 9.22 of Bhagavad Gita, he says something amazing. He says, Ananyas chintayantumam ye janaha paryupasate tesha nitya abhiyuktanam yoga kshema bahamiyaham He says, for those who are ananya in their bhakti, tasma ekena manasa, that means apart from Krishna, I have no one else in my heart. Apart from Krishna and apart from his instructions, I don't have anything else that forms the base of my life. In other words, except for Krishna, Krishna is all his whole and soul for me. If we develop and cultivate that mentality in our lives, then what will happen is, very simply, that this verse that tells us that Krishna becomes everything to us, then we actually become connected to him very automatically. It doesn't become difficult. Why? Because Krishna says, Ananyas chintiyantumam ye janaha paribhasate tesha mitya abhiyuktana. If we are always engaged in this, this is an important point. Even here, tasmat sarveshu kalesha, at all times, devotional service and yoga cannot be performed sporadically. Like everything else in this world. You can't wake up one morning and tell your employer, I feel like working today, I'm coming in. And you can't call him the next day, you know what, I'm not in the mood. No, it doesn't work like that. You can't get married to your wife and say, today I'm really in love with you. Tomorrow, you know what, I don't feel so much. You can't wake up one morning and tell your child, today I'm in the mood to bathe you. And next day, I don't have mood to bathe you. Nobody can live that way and say that they have love for someone. This is very important. Consistency is the hallmark of a loving relationship even in the material world. Consistency. And consistency is the hallmark of a developed spiritual life. Whatever we take up for Krishna, we must do it day in, day out. In the beginning, it will not be spontaneous. But love is not always spontaneous. Love is about sacrifice. It is also a lot about austerity and penance. But it is mostly about action. We cannot say that Krishna is in our heart, I know Krishna, I love him, that's enough. If you keep telling your wife, I love you, I love you, and you never do anything to show that you love her, she's going to hit you on your head one day. It will come very soon. It will. Because everybody knows that if you feel for someone, you have to act on it. So if we claim to be yogis, and that too with bhakti, we have to translate our thoughts into action. 
And that is why we must put aside some time every day to connect to Krishna. But instead of sitting down very quietly to remember Krishna very peacefully and say that is yoga, a more active and dynamic and practically easier way is to simply chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, 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 Hare Rama, 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 Rama. I have an uncle who always fights with me about this. He is about 75 years old. He is very good with all these yogic asanas. And he tells me, I sit down and meditate for three hours straight. And you can't even sit down. And when you sit down, you have to chant. You should sit and meditate. And his grandchildren come by the side and tell me, he meditates so well that we hear him snoring very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he denies it wholeheartedly. But the fact of the matter is, it is so easy to chant. Because when you chant, your mind immediately becomes captured. It is dynamic, it flows, and most importantly, you establish a connection which is real. And if you do this every day and set aside some time, it becomes your special appointment with God. We have appointments with our dentists, which is not very special. Sometimes you have appointments with your doctors. And sometimes, even if you're not so sick, by the time you see the doctor, just seeing him, you become more sick. Isn't it? And I don't know how it is in, in, in the US, being a welfare state. But in Singapore, even if there is no such thing as welfare and medical bills in Singapore, so if you work very hard for the whole life and save up all your savings, all you need is one major disease at the end of your life and all your savings are wiped out. And very often people don't die of that serious disease. They die of the thought that the savings are gone. <laughs> There's enough to wipe them out. The first heart attack comes because it came. The second heart attack comes when you see the bill. And it's over. And in that way, we make appointments with doctors, with lawyers. That is also not highly recommended. <laughs> you make appointments with dentists, and you make appointments with everyone. But our appointment with Krishna, very fluid. When I feel like it, there is an appointment. When I don't feel like it, never mind. That is why we are not happy permanently. And that is why we cannot capture peace with our heart. And that is why, as this verse 266 tells us, our mind is always disturbed. That's why our humble request to all of you is very simple. Try to chant the names of the Lord. And try to chant in a way that is consistent. You all know your own timings. My humble request is, find the time of the day when it's just you and Krishna. Sit down and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare but then the next question is, what will happen then? Because if you want to know someone, you also have to have some knowledge of him. So chanting is very good. But if you chant and you get to know about who you're chanting, and what is his name, and where he comes from, who is this Krishna, then you cement your relationship with him. And that is why by reading Bhagavad Gita, or by reading any of the scriptures of the world, one forms a strong, deep understanding and faith and connection with the Supreme Lord. And that's why we request devotees, chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And daily you just take one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, sit down and read it, end to end. Hardly it will take you 10 minutes. And nobody dies putting aside 10 minutes for the good Lord. If you read for 10 minutes, you chant for 10 minutes, and then you begin your day's activities for his satisfaction by remembering how Arjuna did that for Krishna, you have understood the true purport of the Gita. Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is non-different from Krishna, he was actually moving with his devotees in the southern part of India. And he came across this illiterate Brahmana. And this illiterate Brahmana, a very nice devotee. He could not read, but he was doing something strange. He was actually holding his Gita, which he could not read, and he was having tears in his eyes. So Mahaprabhu comes up to him and says, My dear Brahmana, what are you doing? He says, I am looking at the Gita. But Mahaprabhu knew that he could not read. So he thought, are you making a show of spiritual advancement? Because that's what many people thought. And that's what the verse in the purport Prabhupada says, that it's better not to make a show of spiritual advancement and to be true to who you are. But this Brahmana intrigued Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he asked him, but you are illiterate. 
So what are you looking at the Gita and having tears in your eyes for? And he said that my spiritual master, he gave me the order to read the Gita, even though I'm illiterate. So I'm just trying to follow the orders of my spiritual master. Mahaprabhu said, that's very nice. I'm also trying to follow the orders of my spiritual master. My spiritual master told me that I have very dull head. Therefore, it is easier for me to just chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Rama. So then he asked, my dear Brahmana, you are a very, very nice disciple of your guru. Even though you are not materially capacitated to be able to perform this action, you are doing it on the basis of faith. But let me ask you, why are you then crying? And he said that when I remember, and as I recall, because my spiritual master has told me how Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, decided to take up the lowly duty of being a charioteer to his devotee Arjuna. How he had to weather all the arrows that came to him and how he would have to just take orders from his own devotee and how humble and peaceful he remained to serve his devotee. When I remember how merciful and recall how great the Lord is, then the tears come to my eyes because I realize how merciful the Supreme Personality of Godhead is. And that is why I'm coming. So Mahaprabhu embraces the Brahmana and he tells all the devotees who are skeptical, he tells them all, this illiterate Brahmana, he has understood the true purport of the Gita. So the Gita cannot be understood simply by knowledge. It cannot be understood by erudite scholarship. It cannot be understood by philosophical speculation. Nayam Atma Pravachanena Labhya. Very important. It cannot be understood with our material intelligence. But it can be easily understood if we take up the process of devotion. And if we follow the orders of the spiritual master. And if we take association of like-minded devotees. That is the secret to understanding the Gita. And that is the secret to becoming happy. And that is ultimately the secret to getting everlasting peace. And no one in this room can deny that that is what we are looking for ultimately. Jai Vrindara Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Jai Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai Srila Gurudev ki. Ananda Kodi Vaishnava Vrinda ki. Jai Gaura Prima. Are there any questions, any comments? Ah, no yes. You touched on this, but could you speak a little more about, because the verse said that there can't be happiness without peace. And then, but that's in the context where Krishna is telling Arjuna to fight, which is totally not a peaceful activity. Yes. So how does it fit that, you know, we can't have happiness without peace, and it's putting us, putting Arjuna in a seemingly very unpeaceful circumstance? It's a good point. The peace that Bhagavad Gita speaks about is actually obtained when we follow the instructions of the Supreme. The instructions of the Supreme may appear to be difficult to fulfill. For example, Arjuna found it difficult to fulfill the value of him being a warrior. And he felt and he gave so many arguments to say that I shouldn't be fighting. But Krishna knew that if the Kauravas were to win the war, then this entire world would be plunged into e-religion. And e-religion was not what Krishna wanted. He wanted the Pandavas to bring dharma, spirituality, good behavior and character into the world. And for that it was necessary to end the reigns and the behavior of the Kauravas. Sometimes we also have tendencies in our hearts which are not very good. But if we say that we don't want to stop them or eradicate them because they are part of us, then actually we become consumed by them. So we are all in a position of Arjuna where we all have to decide how we have to conquer or overcome the tendencies of the Kauravas. And sometimes it's not pleasant when we have to do that. We may have to take strict measures, for example, waking up in the morning, austerity, sometimes being very firm about dropping certain habits that in the past we were very attracted to. But if we do it because it is given to us by the order of the spiritual master, or it's given to us through the teachings of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, and we perform it for his satisfaction, then that satisfaction, Prabhu, 
no matter how difficult the activity is, produces peace and happiness. And because we become dependent on Krishna and not anyone else, that dependence actually makes us Krishna conscious. A key word to understand Krishna consciousness is it is that it is self-manifested. It must come from within. And it can only come from within when we depend on Krishna. The moment we depend on everything else except Krishna, then it becomes difficult. That's why I think it is in 1857 of Bhagavad Gita, Chaita Saha Sarva Karmani, Shoya Si Vinam Shasi. 1857 and 58, I think. These two verses explain to us exactly what Krishna consciousness is. Arjuna is told by Krishna, Chetasaha Sarva Karmani. In all your activities, whatever your activities are, as a mother you have your duties, as a father you have your duties. We all have different hats and we wear them at different times. But whatever hat we wear, we should be clear who we want to satisfy. If we want to satisfy Krishna, be the best mother you can be. If you want to satisfy Krishna, be the best father you can be. If you want to satisfy Krishna and you're a lawyer, be the best lawyer you can be. And as Arjuna was told, be the best warrior you can be. All you have to do is put Krishna ahead of yourself. So, Machitaha, Chetasaha Sarva Karmani, Mai Sanyasa. Actually, the moment we perform any activity for Krishna, we all become sannyasis. That is the real definition of sannyas. The moment we are not attached to the result of what comes and we give it to Krishna, that is immediately sannyas. Whether you are in karma yoga, jnana yoga, or bhakti yoga, that is immediately sannyas. And therefore he says, give up that tendency. And instead, what does he say? Machitta satatam, chetasa sarva karmani, mai sannyasa, mai sannyasa, matraraha, buddhi yoga mupasvitya. In other words, use your intelligence. And using your intelligence, then what do you do? Make sure that you are conscious of my activities. Machitta satatam bhava, all the time. So consciousness comes by being dependent on Krishna. If you read the translation, Mataji, you have the translation? What does it say? In all activities, just, In all activities, just depend upon me. Just depend upon me. That's the key. The more we depend on Krishna, the more peaceful we become. But if we depend on others, or we depend on matter, we don't become this good. Simple example I'll give you. There was a wife who was always taking care of her husband. And he had an old mother who had long gone, uh, stayed with him, no more staying with him. One day the wife cooks him a good meal, puts it in front of him and says, I have a question, my dear. Husband says, what is it? Wife says, give you a scenario. We are in the ocean, I'm drowning. You're a good swimmer, I can't swim. Your mother is also in the ocean. She also can't swim, and she's just next to me. You only have one chance to save one person. Who are you going to save? This is the question that all husbands don't want to hear. <laughs> we pray the day never comes. But it has come now for this man. So he's having his prasad and he's very cool. He has no questions about it. He says, it's very simple, I'll save my mother. So now wife is upset. I've cooked 20 years for you, served you very well. That old elderly lady never comes to see you. But when it comes to saving, you're going to save her. Why? And he gives an even more simple answer. He says, in our lifetime, we only get one mother. He stops there. <laughs> but you know the implication. Now she becomes more upset. This is too much. So she goes to be very upset. Next day she goes to work, you know, and she has a good friend. So she tells the good friend, you see this? Nonsense, man. I took so good care of him, 20, 30 years of serving him. And that mother of his never comes to see him. But when it comes to saving, mother gets saved and I get drowned. What do you think I should have done in such a situation? And, his fr and her friend gives a very good advice. It's very simple. You should just learn how to swim. <laughs> because if you learn how to swim, you don't have to worry about who's going to save you. You don't have to depend on someone to save you. And this is Krishna consciousness. If we depend on Krishna, then we don't become unnecessarily disturbed. Because whenever we depend on matter, matter disappoints. But when we depend on Krishna, Krishna elevates. This is an important principle. And that's why Krishna tells Arjuna, 
you please depend on me. And if you depend on me, next verse, Mataji, very nice. That whatever obstacles there are in front of you, Mat Prasada Tarisyasi, by my grace, right? Mataji, can you yes. read it to us? No, I mean the translation. If you become conscious conscious of me, you will pass over all the obstacles of conditioned life by my grace. That's it. Just stop there. That means if we become conscious of Krishna, if we do Krishna consciousness, if we perform bhakti yoga, then whatever obstacles come before us, Krishna gives us the strength to face these obstacles. We don't say they go, but he will allow us to actually cross over them. However, he gives a warning in the last line. Mataji, can you read it? If, however, mm -hmm. you do not work in such consciousness... Ah, if, however, you don't work in such consciousness of depending on Krishna, then what happens? But act through false ego, not hearing me, you will be lost. That's it. That's the other problem with us. Very often we depend more on our false ego. And we give all the favorable arguments why we are right. The mind will tell us why to chant. Today the program is going to finish very late. And by the time I go home, it will be very late. Tomorrow morning is a new day. I don't have time to wake up early in the morning. The next day I'll be all right. If I wake up too early, my health will go. Then the next day I can't chant. And like that, so many arguments are there. But they're all coming from false ego. And we don't want to hear Krishna. We don't want to hear our spiritual masters. So the reason that when that happens, we become lost. And how do we know we are lost? Very simple. My spiritual master said, it's very easy to know you're lost. One, you are always angry. And two, you're always agitated. And if you're not angry, then the cousin of anger is there. That's the third A. You're always anxious. So either there is agitation, anger, or anxiety. And in some way or another, they will catch you at different points of your life. So I hope that helps. All right. Should we chant Krishna's names then? Yes. That will be the best thing, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Are we going to chant very loudly? Children, children are the best chanters of names. Do you agree? Yeah. Yes, because they chant really loudly. And they love it, you know. Yeah. They get tired of hearing people speaking too long, correct? Yes. So now they prefer to chant. So let's chant Krishna's names for about 10 minutes. And then we invite everyone for Prasad to move. All the kids go forward, sit there. Ah, yeah, come, 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 come. Come, come. Come. Kids. 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 come. So what, what are we chanting today? We're chanting the mantra. Do you all know the mantra? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Very easy, right? Now be louder. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. When we chant, who should we be thinking of? Krishna. Yes, so we can see this beautiful picture of Krishna, right? So when we chant, we remember Krishna. Do we remember anyone else? No. no. Do we want to remember anyone else? No. Very good. That's why you're part of the team. <laughs>
because they've taken so much trouble today to get all of you together so that we have a platform to remember Krishna. Whatever we did today, including the jumping and the dancing, it's all yoga, by the way. <laughs> and you can realize how fun, how wonderful, and how blissful it actually is. Jai Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki. Jai! Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.